And today we come to the 25th chapter, which is an interesting story. Uh, there's so much in here. I'm, I'm, I'm real blessed learning what I'm learning from it. Historically, it's an interesting portion because we saw last week how David, he had that tender heart and he had that temperance. And despite the fact that the uh, king was acting like a tyrant toward him and, and the king was delivered into his hands, David's tender heart prevented him from uh, smiting uh, the Lord's anointed. And that tender conscience of his held him back. And of course, in the 26th chapter, a similar account will occur. And David again will hold himself back from hurting Saul, the anointed. But this middle chapter... Uh, maybe this is where David stumbles a little bit. And of course, as we all know, that in our walk with the Lord, uh, sometimes we do stumble. It's an interesting thing, you know, just the way I think about it, how God designed the actual art of walking. Every step is an incipient fall. That's just how he designed it. I mean, you're safest just to stand. The minute you start to lean forward, that foot better catch you. Every step is an incipient fall. And, it, and, and uh, that's why maybe just men fall seven times, because we, we misstep. And in this chapter, we'll kind of see David uh, having some trouble. Uh, David uh, will be introduced to a character named Nabal and a woman named Abigail. And uh, thank goodness for this woman, for a wise woman. It's just something I want to say. You know, the Lord uses women. They're really important. They're very important. They have a tender side to them. We men have testosterone. We do crazy things sometimes. They, they, they temper us. And they're very thankful for this woman in this story. So here we open up. We saw that David, at the last chapter, last verse, he swear unto Saul. Saul went home. But David and his men get up to the hold because they realize this thing is not over. This, this man has a root of bitterness and... Uh, uh, a green envy inside of him and, and uh, this hatred is not going to end. And while David's out there in the hold with his men, Samuel died. And all the Israelites were gathered together and they lamented him and they buried him in his house at uh, Ramah. And uh, again, the book is, we're in Samuel. And Samuel was introducing us to the book and uh, Samuel was, as we saw, was a transition from the time of Judges to the time of Kings. And Samuel was the last judge, and Samuel was a good judge, and he was a good man. And uh, Israel said, no, we don't want you to lead us anywhere. We want a king like the other nations. And they had turned from him. And now, and now that he's dead, all of a sudden they're lamenting him. It kind of reminds me of uh, what Jesus said to the Pharisees in Matthew 24. Oh, you, you, know, you, you hypocrites, you, you build the tombs of the prophets and garnish the sepulchers of the righteous. Now that he's dead, all of a sudden we have respect for him. People are funny that way. Someone dies and they have a lot of good things to say about someone. Uh, maybe some men are worthy of good things to be said of them. Maybe some men aren't. But here's the more important thing. Why don't we give honor when it's due in the land of the living? When someone's serving the Lord and patting him on the back and go, thank you, brother, that, that means a lot to me. Instead, they, they ignored this man and now that he's dead, they, they lament him all of a sudden, a hypocritical lamentation for these folks because you can see that they're really not interested in, in serving the Lord. And um, human nature hasn't changed in thousands of years. We're still not crazy about serving the Lord. You, but you want to just stop for a minute and say, thank goodness the Lord wants to save you whether you want to serve him or not. He never saved anyone based on their future service. If he did, that'd be based on works. And there's no works. Salvation's of grace, by grace, any testament. Because God is God. He hasn't changed Old or New Testament. And, and he always looks with grace upon people. And so here he is, even some uh, disobedient Israelites, we have disobedient Christians. Um, the Lord is gracious. Anyways, with the death of uh, Samuel, at the end of verse 1, David arose and went down to the wilderness of Paran. And he recognized, he said, look, the guy on the throne is right now filled with another spirit. And the only restraining influence I had was that prophet. And now that that prophet is gone, all hell's going to break loose. 
So I better head out of here. So the wilderness of Paran, you head down in Judea, back toward the Sinai Peninsula. And the wilderness of Paran is an area on the Sinai Peninsula that borders the southern west aspect of, of Judah. And it's a place where Moses had the people in some of the wilderness wanderings, and that's where they were. And David's kind of in the wilderness now because the one man to intercede on his behalf is dead. And now he's got to draw real close to the Lord. And when he's down here in this wilderness of Paran, another man's introduced to us. There was a man in Maon, the southern border there, whose possessions were in Carmel, another southern place in Judea. And the man was very great. And he had 3,000 sheep and a thousand goats. And he was shearing his sheep in Carmel, and the name of the man was Nabal. And the name of his wife was Abigail. And she was a woman of good understanding and of a beautiful countenance. But the man was churlish and evil in his doings. And he was of the house of Caleb. Now we're going to see here in the beginning of this chapter, as these new characters are introduced, that we have kind of an odd couple marriage, kind of a mixed marriage. We have a man who is a wealthy man, verse 2. I mean, he has uh, much sheep, 3,000, and a 1,000 goats. And, and this is a wealthy guy. I mean, if uh, three sheep are equal to an automobile, he's like having a 1,000 automobiles. I mean, this guy's a rich guy. Got a lot of wealth. And we also see he has a wife. And we learn that his wife is a wise woman, a woman of good understanding. Notice how God puts that first and the countenance second. Because, see, what the Lord wants is, is the inner man of the heart to be adorned with wisdom and knowledge and understanding. And the outer man, it's nice if it's beautiful, but it doesn't last all that long. Beauty is... A, fading type of a thing, but inner beauty grows. And, and the Lord puts that first. He puts the spiritual part first. Uh, but she's in a strange marriage. She's with a man who, although he's wealthy and he's got a wife, he's wicked. He's a churlish and an evil man in his doings. And how mixed marriage like this occurred back in Israel, it probably worked out where it was an arranged marriage. I mean, a man of this kind of wealth could buy himself a good wife, probably through the father who wanted the dowry, and uh, probably worked it out like that. And there she is, kind of in a rough marriage. And the, the sad thing about this man is he's of the house of Caleb. Caleb was a good man. Yeah. Caleb was of the tribe of Judah. This man's of the tribe of Judah. This man's of the same tribe that David is, the kingly tribe. He's, he's got a well-born heritage. I mean, he's, he's wealthy. He's uh, well-born, but he's wicked, despite having all this favor, wealth, good heritage, good wife, and he's still wicked. <coughs> the Lord wants us to understand uh, it's the heart. It's not the circumstances. It's not what's around us that matters. It's what's in us. Like Jesus says, it's not from without, it's within and something in this heart of his was churlish and evil. David, verse 4, heard in the wilderness that Nabal did shear his sheep. It was that time of the season when they sheared the sheep. And uh, that was a, a joyous time. Verse 5, And David sent out ten young men. And David said unto his young men, Get you up to Carmel, and go to Nabal, and greet him in my name. And thus shall you say to him that liveth in prosperity, you say, Peace be both to thee, and peace to thine house, and peace be to all that thou hast. And David sends his men up with a beautiful salutation of peace. And that's a, a good way to live your life. In other words, I'm offering the right hand of fellowship to someone. I mean, maybe I've even heard this guy is kind of a funny, churlish guy, but I still want to offer him the right hand of fellowship. Boy, that's a good way to deal with people. I mean, maybe this guy had a reputation. His name was Nabal. Did his parents give him that name? It's curious, that name Nabal means fool. So I can't imagine that the parents gave him the name. It must be that's what he become known by for the way that he behaved. A man that was kind of a foolish man that was very self-centered. 
And maybe David knew those things, but David said, nonetheless, I want you to go and offer the right hand of fellowship. You know, sometimes we hear about people at a church and, you know, he's, a, he's not easy to get along with that. And, and we put walls and guards up before giving them a chance firsthand and offering them the right hand of fellowship. It's always good to offer the right hand of fellowship. Maybe we've heard wrong about someone. Maybe we've, been, we've judged someone wrong because of hearsay. I think that happens a lot, unfortunately. So David just uh, sent him a good salutation. Verse 7, and, and now, David says, I heard that thou hast shearers. Now thy shepherds, which were with us, we hurt them not. Neither was there aught missing unto them all the while that they were in Carmel. Let's, let me just back up and tell you a little. You remember the past few chapters we saw how when David, he was hiding out in that one cave and everyone that was in distress and everyone that was in debt, and everyone that was discontented came unto him. And it started, a band of men started to knit their hearts to David. They began to realize, we got a wicked ruler on the throne, but we have a man here that God's anointed, and even though he's not on the throne, he goes in and out among the people, he's faithful, he's trustworthy, I'm going to throw my lot in with him. And we saw how that was a picture of today, uh, Satan's on the throne of the world as the God of this world. And today, the greater David Jesus isn't on the throne of the world. But as we begin to learn of him, we go, hey, that's someone I'm going to throw my lot in with. And people who are discontented and debt and, and distressed come to the lesser David as we come to the greater David. Now, David has these men, 400, and then the last chapter we saw it was up to 600. How do you take care of 600 men? How do you provide for them? I don't know if there were 7-Elevens out there in the wilderness of Peyran. I don't know. I don't know if there are fast food restaurants. There were? She, she think, okay. <laughs> My wife does great research. What was the name of the place there? Okay. Anyways, um, you got to take care of these men. And here's another thing with these men. These men were discontented and they were in distress and they were in debt. And you think, well, they're a bunch of rabble-rousers. But well, we studied a few chapters ago. They weren't rabble-rousers. They were good men that were discontented and distressed and in debt because of a bad leader. And they had lost their homes and they had lost things because of the evil way he was ruling from the throne. Just like in America, we see people thrown out of work because of evil rulers. Good, hardworking people are thrown out of work in this country. It's sad. And so we see this thing. So, so here are these men. And, and they're recognizing, we've got a good leader here, and he's not on the throne. Got a bad leader on the throne. And you know what happens to men like that? They start, because they're men, they have testosterone, they want to do something about it. They'd like to start a revolution. That happens. Uh, you know, let's fix this problem. And David's trying to keep these men quiet. And he's trying to keep them from exploding, becoming like a bunch of zealots, like used to happen at the time of Jesus, and they'd lead insurrections. He's trying to keep these men down. And he said, you know, I got to keep you busy. I know a way to keep you busy. This wealthy man, Nabal, has 3,000 sheep and 1,000 goats, and he's got 1,000 uh, plus acres, like uh, Ben Cartwright on the Ponderosa. And, and this much I know, because he's bordering on the wilderness of Paran, and down here there are Hittites and there are some Ammonites and Moabites, and I know he suffers losses because marauders, bands of men would come and steal sheep at night and cattle rustlers and all that stuff went on. And Saul wasn't doing his job protecting the people. He said, why don't we become like a, a, a small... A secret detail, uh, like you would go out and you'd hire a rent-a-cop. And so we'll become like a private security firm. And we'll watch out, we'll watch out for him. Because after all, one day when we are in the position and I am on the throne, it's going to be my job to provide peace and safety to these people. So let's practice it now. Let's do the work of the ministry now, of a king now. And so they're out there and they had been protecting this man and protecting his goods. And so when David sends his men at the time of shearing a few months later to them, he says, verse 7, I've heard that uh, thou hast shearers. Now, thy shepherds, which were with us, we hurt them not. We didn't treat them like those Moabites. Neither was there aught missing unto them. All the while we were in Carmel, we were your secret service firm. We were your, your private security firm taking care of you. So, the message to give in, in light of the service after the salutation I gave to you with all the peace. Verse 8, ask the young men and they will show thee. Nabal, go ask your men. Wherefore, let the young men 
that's my young men, find favor in thine eyes, for we are coming a good day. I mean, this is a good season. God's prospered you. You're cheering. You have, you have plenty left over. Give, I pray thee, whatsoever cometh to thine hand unto thy servants, and then after that to thy son David. And then let's share in the spoils. And one of the reasons you still retain the 3,000 and 1,000 as opposed to just having 2,500 and 500 is because we kept all that for you. And so now how about uh, a little sharing of the bounty just so my men have some supplies and they have a little food and they have a little clothing. It's a very simple request. And David makes a request of this man, Nabal. And uh, again, he says, verse 8, uh, Wherefore, let the young men find favor in thine eyes, for we are come in a good day. God's blessed you. God's prosper you. Uh, give, I pray thee, whatsoever cometh into thine hand. In other words, you determine. You make the determination based on what comes in your hand. If a good one, and you want to save it for yours, and one that's a little blemished for us, that's going to be perfectly fine. You make the selection. This is reasonable. This is the way the greater David asks us to give to his work. In 2 Corinthians chapter 8, he tells us, he says, you know, the, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, he says in 2 Corinthians 8 verse 9, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that through his poverty you might be rich. And here and I give my advice. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 9, verses 10. Here I give my advice. Verse 11, now therefore perform the doing of it. He says in verse 12, if there be first a willing mind, it's accepted, here we go, according to that a man hath. Nabal had, had much. He had a good season. God had blessed him. God had prospered him. According to the man hath, not according to that he hath not. Remember we taught a while ago about we give what's called grace giving. And it's grace purpose giving. We purpose to give based on grace, based on what God's given us. I don't understand faith promise giving because I don't have it yet. I can't write a check for something I don't have. But here is something God's given now. Uh, verse 13, I mean not that other men be eased and ye be burdened. But here's the reality, verse 14, but by an equality that now at this time, it's a good season for you, Nabal, your abundance may be a supply for their want. And then one day in the future, their abundance may also be a supply for your want, that there be equality. God works these things out. And so, so this is a very reasonable request. It's a biblical request that's being given. And he brings it as his servants uh, come. And verse 9, it says, And when David's young men came, they, they spake to Nabal according to all those words in the name of David, and they ceased. David says, go with a salutation. Remind them of the service that we've provided. Remind them of the bounty and the good season that God gave them. Tell them it's his choice. He can make the selection. And the servants came in a very submissive manner and did exactly what they were told. What a blessing. What, what good stewards. You know, when the, when the greater David sends us with a message, do we go and we give the message in the name of our greater David? And do we give it the way he told us to give it? That's a good way to do it. Just, you know, it's a beautiful message we have. I was talking to a Christian recently, and a younger Christian was asking me some questions. And, and I said, the way you, you give the Bible message to someone is you give the truth, you always give the truth. That's what we're supposed to do. But how we're supposed to do it is the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle. You give it gently and in love. I said, I listen to you, you don't scream, you don't preach. I said, well, I don't know that I need to. A soft tongue can break a bone. How forcible are right words? Not how right are forced words. I mean, if, if you just say what the Bible says, the Holy Spirit can do plenty with it. I said, let the Holy Spirit work. I certainly don't want the spirit of Mike convincing anybody. That's not going to last for long. And so the servants come and they just do it right in the name of David, in the name of the Lord, as we do it. Here, here's what it says. So a reasonable request. 
How would you respond? Well, let's see Nabal's response. And Nabal answered David's servant said, Who is David? And who is the son of Jesse? There be many servants nowadays that break away every man from his master. Shall I take of my bread and my water and my flesh that I've killed for my shearers and give it unto men whom I know not whence they be? I mean, just a very arrogant response. Just a, a, an arrogant, self-centered response. And notice all the possessive pronouns. I, my, my, I, my, I, my. All through there. It just reminds you of the parable that Jesus told about the rich man in Luke chapter 12. You know, And God had been so good to that rich man. And God had blessed that rich man. He said, you know, the ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. And here's the ground of Nabal bringing forth plentifully in a good season. Luke chapter 12 and verse 16. And then, the, and then the man thought within himself, hey, what shall I do? Because I have no room where to bestow my fruits. He had plenty of place to bestow his fruits right now. He had needy men right around him. Ah, this will I do. I'll build barns and I'll build greater and there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods. And I'll say to my soul, soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said unto him, Thou Nabal, thou fool. Thou fool. Not understanding that the blessings that you have are from the, the hand of God. If God's given you the power to get any form of wealth at all, you want to thank Him. And you want to be thankful. And you want to look and say, Lord, how would you have me to use this? bounty that you've given me. Not it's mine, mine, mine. He's a fool. And the arrogant response, should I take my bread and my water and my flesh? Well, actually, according to Deuteronomy 15, verse 7, the answer is yes. And that's, that's what it says in, in the book of Deuteronomy when the Lord was explaining them what to do when they were in the land. And this man was in the land of Judea. I know it was a southern part, but he's still in Judea. The Bible says in Deuteronomy 15, verse 7, If there be a poor man among you of thy brethren. Let's see. Caleb, Judah. David, Jesse, Judah. They're in the same family. Not just Israelites, they're within the same tribe. And, and, and the Lord thy God, if, he's, if, if one of thy brethren in any of thy gates, which the Lord thy God giveth thee, thou shalt not harden thine heart, nor shut thine hand from thy poor brother, thou shalt open thine hand wide unto him, and shalt surely lend him sufficient for his need in that which he wanteth. Beware that there be not a thought in thy wicked heart. And of course, we learned that this man was evil. He was churlish. He was wicked. He was selfish. He arrogantly refuses a reasonable request. And by the way, even if David had done nothing for him, there's another passage in Leviticus. I'm trying to remember where it is. Uh, I was reading it just earlier. I'll find it. And in Leviticus, you're required, Leviticus 19, verse 13, that if someone served you, you're required to pay him back. Now, this is not uncommon for people to like to take freebies. Uh, there really is nothing free under the sun except salvation. And, and uh, people are funny that way. Uh, toward the end, this is all going to start up again. And uh, James tells us, The hire of the laborers who have reaped down your fields, which is kept back by fraud of you, crieth, and the cries of them which have reaped are entered into the ears of the Lord of Sabaoth. That's the Lord of hosts. And God is watching this man, Nabal. He's watching this entire encounter. You know, the eyes of the Lord are in every place. They behold our dealings. Uh, I mean, the Lord wants, of course, we saw last week, reconciliation with him. But then after reconciliation with him, he wants peace among the brethren. And here Nabal, just a fool, arrogant fool and refusing. So, verse 12, David's young men turned their way. And they went again and they came and told him all those sayings. And uh, David said unto the men, All right, you're looking for a fight, men. 
gird ye on every man his sword. You've been looking for a battle. You've been looking for a revolution. Here we go. And they girded on every man his sword. And they kept the powder dry and now they loaded it up and they got the shotguns and here they go and David girded on his sword and they went up after David about 400 men and 200 abode by the stuff and they're heading to make war. David's angry. David's reaction, it's natural. It's a natural reaction. I mean, here you are, you've been good to someone. You've treated them well. You've extended yourself. You've stayed up at night. You've protected them. You've sweat during the day. And now it's payday. Shearing time is payday. Nabal should have sent something without even being requested. You ever work a job and you didn't get the check? I did. I worked at a job where they didn't send the check the first week. And then they didn't send it the second week. And then I had to go in and say, excuse me, but... And actually it was bi-weekly, so a month had passed without a paycheck. And I said, I've been working here for the past month. Do you remember me? You hired me. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Don't you remember me? You asked me to work here. <laughs> it's very frustrating. He just expect the check to come in the mail or to be delivered to you. And David didn't get the check. And then David went and request and had been doing his work. And this is the response. And he got angry. And, uh, but but uh, the Lord wants to intervene. You see, the Lord doesn't like when we get angry. We're to cease from anger. We're to forsake wrath. And the Lord, the Lord wants to work with his servant David. The Lord loves David. David loves the Lord. And the Lord wants to work quickly, and he's going to get someone. Verse 14, but one of the young men told Abigail, Nabal's wife, saying, Behold, David sent messengers out of the wilderness to salute our master. <laughs> and he railed on them. I mean, not only was he arrogant toward them, not only did he make accusations about David, knowing full well, if he knew he was Jesse's son, he knew who he was. Everybody knew what was going on in Israel at this time. I'm willing to bet this, this, this Nabal guy just... Look, I don't like the government. Do you? I don't like an evil government. This guy probably didn't like the government either because he had to pay tribute and tithe. Probably complaining about Saul all the time. Probably happy when he heard David's going to take over, but not when David wants a piece of his pocket. Yeah, it's funny, Christians are that way. They'll complain about the government. They'll complain about Satan. They'll complain about taxes. And then when they hear about a tithe, whoa, whoa, whoa what's that all about? God wants my money? The Nabal acts, sometimes we act foolish that way in ourselves. Anyways, this servant intercedes. Now, I like this. He's not given by name. And it's a good lesson for us. Remember, there was once a servant that came and told Abram about Lot being stolen. There was once a, a young boy that went and told the centurion that there was a plot against Paul. There's a servant here that comes. You know what the Lord is saying? Look, when you know of something that's going wrong, and there's a way you can intercede by bringing good information to get something toward prayer, do it. Blessed are the peacemakers. This servant is trying to get peace made here. And this servant comes and tells, he works for Nabal. And he's worked there long enough to know that guy's a hothead. But this wife is a good woman. And I know who to go to. And he knows who to appeal to. And he goes and he says, our master railed on him. He abused them. Verse 15, but let me tell you the whole story. The men were very good to us. We were not hurt. Uh, neither missed we anything as long as they were conversant. We were conversant with them when we were in the fields. They were a wall unto us, both by night and day. They were our private security firm. All the while, uh, we were with them keeping the sheep. I mean, why do you think we had such a good, bountiful year? None of the Ammonites, none of the Moabites, none of the Philistines, nobody could take anything from us. We're used to having losses every year, and everything's going well because they're here. You know, it's good when you have Christian employees. The, 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 the purloining, the pilferage, the stealing goes down. I was reading about um, a revival that happened in Ireland about 200 years ago. It was a guy, Nick Nicholson was the name, or Nichols? He was the preacher there. And uh, in Ireland, they had the shipyards and the docks. And most of the men were drunkards and thieves and everything. And this guy started preaching at the docks. And... 
tens and then hundreds of people got saved. There was a massive revival. And then, and then the men went home and they had like stolen stuff from the dockyards and the shipyards. And of course the Holy Ghost convinced them and they started bringing stuff back. And they brought so much stuff back they had to build three airplane size hangers for all the stuff that was returned. It's good to have Christians working for you. You're going to have bountiful years. There won't be any theft. That's what it's like having David's men around. This was, we had a great year. They kept everything. Verse 17, now, now therefore know and consider what thou wilt do. For evil is determined against our master and against all his household. He's such a son of Belial uh, that a man cannot speak to him. Now, now we learned earlier in the book of Samuel, the sons of Belial were associated with alcohol. And we're going to see later in the chapter, this guy's a drunkard. And again, spirits, unclean spirits move in that bottle. Don't look upon it when it's red, when, when his color is in the cup. Whose color? Next verse, the serpent. And, and, and you, you get these unclean spirits and uh, you become a son of Belial. You're your father, the devil. This man was unlawful. This man was untruthful. This man's ungrateful. This man's a fool. So when Abigail hears this, she made haste. She took 200 loaves and two bottles of wine and five sheep ready dressed and five measures of parched corn and a hundred clusters of raisins and two hundred cakes of figs and laid them on asses. And she said to her servants, Go, go on before me. Behold, I come after you. But she told not her husband Nabal. Smart girl, like a, a woman in a marriage where uh, the, the man doesn't want to give anything to the work of the Lord, but she's got a checkbook of her own and she writes a little check to give it, give something to the Lord's work. She's a smart girl. And... Uh, she, verse 20, and it was so, and as she wrote on the ass that she came down by the covert of the hill, and behold, David and his men came down against her, and she met them. Now David had said before to the men, Surely in vain have I kept all that this fellow hath in the wilderness, so that nothing was missed of all that pertained unto him. And he hath requited me evil for good. And we saw before, when you requite evil for good, you're looking for trouble. But that's God's business, not David's. David's overstepping his bounds. David's so worked up in the heat of the moment. The testosterone is flowing. The blood pressure is high. The veins are bulging. You know how men get sometimes, especially young, strong men. Old guys like us, we, low T, we don't get upset over anything. We just laugh. Right, lovey? He's used to, but but the young men still get angry. And, and so David, he's in his 20s here. And so, and he goes on, he says, So and more also do God unto the enemies of David, if I leave of all that pertain to him by morning light any that pisseth against the wall. He's not just going to kill Nabal. He's going to kill all the men in the family. He's going to kill the sheep shares. He's going to kill everyone. And pisseth against the wall is a term for a male. Because only men can do that. Women can't do that. And um, so he, he's going to kill all the men. I mean, he, he's, the retribution is overboard. The sheep shearers never did anything wrong to him. It wasn't their fault that their head had behaved so crazily. But again, he wants to show you, God wants to show you congregational responsibility. If you're in a bad place and the head is acting bad, don't be surprised if you get hurt too when the judgment comes upon that head. Because you're attached to it. Verse 23, and when Abigail saw David, she hasted and she lighted off the ass and fell before David on her face and bowed herself to the ground and she fell at his feet and she said, Upon me, my Lord, uh, upon me let this iniquity be. Let thine handmaid, I pray thee, speak in thine audience and hear the words of thine handmaid. She shows respect. She shows repentance, getting down in a humble position. Verse 25, she says, Let not my Lord, I pray thee, regard this man of Belial, even Nabal. Thinking, God, I can live with this guy every day. You think it's rough just dealing with him at pay time? Uh, for as his name is, so is he. Nabal is his name and folly is with him. He's a fool. He's living up to his name or down to it. But, 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 I, thine handmaid, saw not the young men of my Lord, whom thou dost send. This reproach was not from me, it was my husband. Verse 26, Now therefore, my Lord, as the Lord liveth, and as thy soul liveth, seeing that the Lord hath withholden thee from coming to shed blood, and from avenging thyself with thine own hand. That's a very gentle 
marshmallow reproof she just gave. Yeah. See, a reproof doesn't have to be screamed. A lot of people think that uh, later on we're going to read in the next uh, book that uh, the one prophet, was it Nathan, came to David, Thou art the man! I don't think he did that at all. I think he just told him the story and when David got all upset, he said, Friend, brother, thou art the man. And I think that poked him right away. I think if you screamed at him, it wouldn't have gotten anywhere. But I think he spoke softly. He went, oh, my goodness, you're right. That's me. And notice how gently she reproves him. Just, you know, the Lord hath withholden thee from coming to shed blood and from avenging thyself with thine own hand. Yeah, who am I to take vengeance? This is working on his spirit. Now let thine enemies and they that seek evil to my Lord be as Nabal. And now this blessing which thy handmaid hath brought unto my Lord, let it uh, even be given unto the young men that follow my Lord. I, I want to give you a recompense and a reward for your labor. And verse 28, I pray thee, forgive the trespass of thine handmaid, for the Lord will certainly make my Lord, now that, that's the Father in heaven, will certainly make my Lord, that's you, David, a sure house. Because my Lord, that's you, David, fighteth the battles of the Lord, and evil hath not been found in thee all thy days. She recognizes David's heart and the type of character and integrity he has. He was known. They had sung, David had slain his ten thousands. He had gone in and out and behaved himself wisely among all the people. She knew. Remember, she was of a good understanding. She was like the woman of Shunem. She recognized a good man. She recognized the spirit in a good man. Boy, I hope women would recognize that. That's a blessing, ladies. It's a blessing when you can tell the difference between someone who really loves God. And of course, if any man loves God, it should be known to them. And someone who's just trying to pretend like they love God. And she recognized it. She had recognition right there. And she says in verse 29, Yet a man is risen to pursue thee and to seek thy soul. But, in talking about Saul, But the soul of my Lord, that's David, shall be bound in the bundle of life with thee, Lord, thy God. And the souls of thine enemies, them shall he sling out as out of the middle of a sling. And it shall come to pass when the Lord shall have done to my Lord according to all the good that he hath spoken concerning thee and shall have appointed thee ruler in Israel that this shall be no grief unto thee nor offensive heart unto my Lord either that thou hast shed blood causeless or that my Lord hath avenged himself. But when the Lord shall have dealt well with my Lord then remember thine handmaid. And, and she says, look at." She respects him. She showed repentance. She talked about the reproach of her husband because he's nuts. And, and she said, but look, at, I, I, I want to recompense you and I recognize that God's on your side and I don't want you to have regrets in the future. How many things have we done in Christians in haste, in anger, and we think back on them years later? If only I had handled that situation better. If only I could have kept myself under control. If only I could have kept my tongue. Maybe I've stumbled someone. How many people would have been stumbled if David had done what he had done here? It's a beautiful, humble way that she approaches. And David, being tender to the Spirit of God, David said to Abigail, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, which sent thee this day to meet me. D the, David here is going to recognize, first he praises God, blessed be the Lord God of Israel. And he recognizes it's the providence of God at work. You see, God wants to work in our lives. How many times has God tried to stop us from doing something and yet we just push on through where God hasn't opened a door? And and David's recognizing the principle that James speaks of in James chapter 1. 
I mean, he, he caught it. His, his, his heart was tender to God. This is why he's a man after God's heart. Yes, we see a mistake here, but watch how quickly he responds to the movement of God. James 1, verse 19. Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak. Look, she just gave a long speech. How many times have, I remember I was at this work situation once and somebody buzzed in my ear and got me worked over, uh, over something and I went down the hall just out of control and, and cornered this person in the office and then the Lord had to work with me and uh, I, I, what happened was I stopped and realized what I was doing right there and I said, oh my goodness, I, I, I apologized and I got down and prayed at a chair right there in front of that person because I just realized what, what happened there. I mean, I shouldn't have let that person set me off. I mean, here David had been set off like a Roman candle. And here, this woman makes a speech. Now, sometimes when you're set off like a Roman candle, someone's trying to stop you, you just push him aside. But David was swift to hear and slow to speak. He, had, he could have just given the same speech to her that he had just given to his men, but he didn't. He wanted to hear her side. Sometimes we need to be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to speak. To wrath. Why? For the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. God doesn't need our anger and our wrath to get his work done down here. And they'll know you're my disciples by the wrath and the anger and the way you spit. No, no, no. They, no, no. 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 Those people are lost. Were you ever lost? You know, some of us get saved so young at 8, 9, 10 years old, we don't know what it's like. But if you get saved at 20, 30, or 40, remember what it was like before you got saved? That's the condition they're in. The God of this world's blinded their mind. They're in darkness. They, 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 they know not what they do, like Jesus prayed from the cross. So David, he, he, he follows the principle that James wrote thousands of years before he wrote it. And he says, verse 33, and, and blessed be thy advice, and, and blessed be thou which has kept me this day from coming to shed blood and from avenging myself with mine own hand. For, for in very deed has the Lord God of Israel liveth, which hath kept me back from hurting thee. Except thou hast hasted and come to meet me, surely there had not been left unto Nabal by the morning light any that pisseth against the wall. So David received of her hand that which she had brought him and said unto her, Go up in peace to thine house. See, I have hearkened to thy voice and have accepted thy person. Here's what's happening. Our boy David, a good man, and we love him. And in 24, he doesn't touch the Lord's anointed. In 26, he doesn't touch the Lord's anointed. But in 25, he's about to kick an equal or maybe someone who he considers a little below him. How often do we get mad and kick people down the ladder from us? Or kick people we think are equal, but we never say anything to a man above us like the boss. That's almost like a kind of human nature. It really is. And, and here's David, and he's getting ready to go to do this thing, and here... God, I call this chapter foolish anger diffused. See, Nabal's a fool. And you know what gets us angry sometimes? Fools. <laughs> Fools get us angry. Amen. And then we go off half cocked as if our anger is going to fix the fool. And how many times has the Lord tried to send an Abigail of like the Holy Spirit our way through somebody to stop us? before our foolish anger makes more of a mess. And then we'll regret it. Now, we may not kill anyone physically. I don't think we will. But what if we kill someone's chance at believing the gospel because of a witness that's so rooted in anger that they just walk away? If that's what Christianity is about, I've got nothing to do with it. And we've just murdered a bunch of the servants in Nabal, spiritually speaking. Foolish anger. Anger that's sparked by a fool. And God says, let me show you a picture. I want to diffuse it. And Abigail is a picture of that, that anger being diffused. 
And the Lord tries to send Abigails our way. And sometimes he does it just in the person of the Holy Spirit alone. And sometimes he does it, thankfully, in women. I mean, my wife diffuses me a lot. It's a, she'll say, well, have you ever considered this? I mean, the, the women have a tender heart in a lot of areas where men don't. We get blindsided. We get a few of the facts. We start putting together our picture of the story, and it's a little backwards and upside down. And then, then thankfully, uh, an Abigail will come along, a Deborah will come along, a Teresa or a Tina will come along and say, did you consider this? And you think about it for a while. And thank goodness for that. I mean, in very deed, the Lord God keeps us back if we'll be sensitive. And our foolish anger can be diffused if we'd be swift to hear sometimes and not be sure we have all the facts. We don't have all the facts most of the time. I mean, everybody seems right when they first come. Thankfully, some neighbor comes to help give us a little more information. So, so we saw David's request, we saw Nabal's refusal, we saw David's reaction, and we say Abigail working reconciliation. Blessed are the peacemakers. They'll be the children of God. Now God's going to get involved because he's watched this whole thing and he's pleased with how the man that loves his heart has responded. And, and he's pulled back. And he's not going to exercise his hand, that's David, so God's very pleased, so God's going to move in. Verse 36, And Abigail came, Abigail came to Nabal. And behold, he held a feast in his house, a big sumptuous feast like the feast of a king. And his heart was merry with him, for he was very drunken. And a man whose happiness depends on his circumstances has no true joy. And those circumstances are going to come crashing to an end. Wherefore she told him nothing less or more until the morning light. Notice the wisdom. Okay, let's say you're in a marriage and you've got a, 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 a partner that's drunk. There's no, no point in reasoning with a drunk man. You're not going to get anywhere. There's another spirit in them. Anything you sow, that spirit's going to take that seed up and just cast it aside. He's under the control of another spirit. There's no point in talking to drunks. I mean, there's really no point in going down and preaching outside a bar at 12 o'clock midnight with drunk people coming in and out. What, what, I, I, hopefully there's some sober people that will hear, but the drunks aren't going to get anything. And Jesus said it's best to labor during the day when you don't stumble rather than at night. A lot of bad things come out at night. And she had the wisdom. Okay, I'm not going to talk to him at night. Verse 37, but it came to pass in the morning when the wine was gone out of Nabal, his wife told him of these things. So you want to know what happened? You want to know how close you were to getting? You think you're a tough guy? You think you're so smart? You got the next king of Israel with 600 men? You got a bunch of sheep shearers that didn't know how to handle a gun? And David's got a posse with him of sharpshooters? And his heart died within him, and he became as a stone. Verse 38, And it came to pass about 10 days after that the Lord smote Nabal that he died. Remember that story I was telling you in Luke chapter 12. Thou fool, this night shall thy soul be required of thee. Now, now what happened, what the Lord did, I, I, I just think that's amazing. What happened is the Lord smote him once and gave him 10 days before he killed him. He let the heart attack happen and then he didn't let the full death happen until 10 days later. Now this is common. If you've ever treated myocardial infarctions, and I have, most people don't die with an MI. Myocardial infarctions don't kill in most cases. The majority of them are, are minor, and even if they're moderate and even severe, you don't die immediately with a myocardial infarction. It usually takes two to five to ten days later if it's a severe enough MI to kill you. And I wonder if that's just God giving a space for repentance to this man, giving him nine, ten more days. Hey, think about this, buddy. Think about what you just heard. You know, are you going to take this opportunity? I think it's the goodness of God. And this guy just went on his nine or ten days and continued shaking his fist at heaven and God smote him that he died. Verse 39, and so we see God's retribution and now we see the chapter ends. And when David heard that Nabal was dead, he said, Blessed be the Lord that hath pleaded the cause of my reproach from the hand of Nabal and hath kept his servant from evil. Boy, isn't, isn't that 
what we really want? I mean, isn't our desire, now that we've been born again, our desire to follow the Lord in his walk on the straight and narrow path is to try and walk a path of good and to stop straying into evil and doing things that are going to harm not just ourselves but others because no man liveth to himself. It affects others when we do this. Blessed be the Lord that hath pleaded the cause and kept his servant back from evil. I want to be kept from evil. And you can be if we just be sensitive and swift to hear and slow to speak. Our words can be deadly like arrows. And David had real arrows. For the Lord hath returned the wickedness of Nabal upon his own head. Verse 39. And David sent and communed with Abigail to take her to him to wife. And when the servants of David were come to Abigail to Carmel, they spake unto her, saying, David sent us unto thee to take thee to him to wife. And she arose and bowed herself on her face to the earth and said, Behold, let thine handmaid be a servant to wash the feet of the servants of my Lord. That's a good of good understanding. This is a good a woman of good understanding. She she has a spiritual sensitivity to the word like Mary, and she has Martha's hands. Boy, what a combination. Martha's hands and Mary's heart. What a deal. And Abigail hasted and arose and rode upon an ass with five damsels of hers that went after her, and she went after the messengers of David and became his wife. And we see the romances of David. David also took Ahinoam of Jezreel, and they were both of them his wives. But Saul had given Michael, his daughter, David's wife, to Falti, sold her off for a big dowry, the son of Laish, uh, which was of Galim. And the chapter ends with uh, God blessing uh, David in a romantic way because uh, the Lord gives rewards. Now, we saw historically what's happening. We're seeing that God is preparing David for leadership. And in leadership, it's not just how one deals with superiors, but how do you deal with equals and inferiors. And, and David, someday when you're king and you're dealing with kings of other nations, I know you're going to be kind and gracious and cordial to them, but how are you going to treat your fellow workers and how are you going to treat people below? It wasn't David said, well, naturally, I'm going to take it in my own hands. And God says, no, even then you don't take it in your own hands. And practically, that's what the Lord wants to do with us. Well, uh, I heard uh, someone that was teaching on courting and marriage. And he said one of the things a girl should look for if she has a guy she's interested in is watch how he treats elderly people, children, waitresses, Waiters, animals, watch how he treats those who are beneath him and those who are hurting and wounded. And the Lord's showing David, look, I want, it, I want you to learn that you must hold your strength and your power and your vengeance in. The only time David will ever be able to exercise any type of retribution or vengeance if it's just a direct order of the Lord's. And, you know, we're, we're quick on the draw. We've been watching Westerns for years. We practice in the mirror. And, and, and God's trying to show us, look, I want to send some Abigails your way. Whether it's through the scriptures, whether it's through the preachers, the Sunday school teachers, the spouse, our brother or sister in the Lord. There's too much wrath. There's too much anger. And the wrath of man doesn't work the righteousness of God. We know what we're supposed to preach and God wants us to, to preach in a certain way. Foolish anger needs to be diffused. And fools do make us angry. But even if you're angry, we're not supposed to sin and bring evil upon ourselves or others. So we've looked at this story historically. We've looked at it practically. Now, there's a doctrinal teaching, and it's so wow and so different than what you just heard. If I gave it to you, it'd be too many balls to juggle. I'm going to save it for Sunday morning. But it's, it's a portrait. I mean, it's just an amazing thing. You ever look at the clouds? 
and they look one way from one direction and then the God blows them by and they look another way from another side. There's an amazing doctrinal portrait in this chapter that we'll study Sunday morning. But good practical and good historical and the historical works in the practical. Let's thank the Lord. Lord, thank you for showing us that we too have foolish anger and fools get us angry. And yet, Lord, it's always your desire to diffuse that. Thank you for the Abigails in our life. Thank you for the Holy Spirit. Thank you for the Holy Scriptures. Help us, Lord, to be swift to hear and slow to speak and slow to wrath. Lord, there are many that uh, we could wound by our anger. We do not want to do that. We don't want to hurt any of the servants of Nabal out there. Our desire is that we bring them to thee graciously. This I pray in Jesus' name, amen.